Hey gang, I'm going to show you how to power this compact fluorescent light bulb off of batteries using a fairly simple circuit and with only a few parts. The first step is to open up the compact fluorescent light bulb. Sometimes you can pry them open, but most of the times you have to cut them, being careful not to cut too deeply or damage anything inside. Opening it up, you'll either see some electronics like this or just some thin wires like this. In either case, cut the wires so that you leave as long a length as possible going to the fluorescent light tubes. Keep the part with the tubes and thin wires. Don't worry, the tubes are sealed so no mercury will get out. You don't need a lot of other parts. Two 1.5 volt AA batteries and a battery holder, a switch for convenience, a power transistor like this 2N3055 transistor, a variable resistor or a potentiometer. Mine is 100 ohms, which is probably a little bigger than is needed, though bigger will work too. A ferrite core, I salvaged mine from this piece of hardware, which I think is a power supply. You'll also need some wire, some for connecting it all together and some for winding coils. One of the wires will need to be very thin, with thin insulation, often called magnet wire. I got it in this package from Radio Shack, but any electronics store will have it. More on that later. And of course you'll need a tube from a compact fluorescent light bulb. You can start with a working light, or one that no longer works. The tube is usually still okay either way. And here's the circuit. In case you've heard of the Jewel Thief circuit, that's what this is. But the LED is gone, and the small transistor is upgraded to a power transistor, like the 2N3055. It's also handy to replace the fixed value resistor with a variable resistor, or potentiometer. Also, an extra coil is wound on the ferrite core, and the compact fluorescent light bulb is attached to that coil. In this form, it's popularly known as Gina's Light. It took some experimenting to find the right windings for the coil that worked. But what worked for me was to wind 256 turns of 30 gauge wire around first, being careful not to overlap the turns too much. This is often called magnet wire, and what's important here is that the insulation on it is very thin, allowing you to put a lot of turns on this small ferrite core. While there's still a gap of at least around 1 8 of an inch, or 2 millimeters, between where the two ends meet, stop. There's going to be a high voltage between where these two ends meet, so you'll need wire with thicker insulation where the two ends are close together. At this point, I tape the winding solidly to the core, and then soldered wire with thicker insulation onto both ends. Then I finished winding them both, until they met, and taped the ends in place. I added a little bit more tape to flatten out the surface, and insulate more where the soldered ends were. This is followed by 10 turns of 18 gauge wire, surrounding where the first winding ended. Notice that this one has better insulation than just enamel insulation too. Again, to avoid breakdown due to the high voltage. I tried 7 turns first, but the results weren't as good, so don't be afraid to do some experimenting. And lastly, 5 turns of 18 gauge well insulated wire are wound on top of that. They can all be wound in the same direction. Of course I first connected it all together with alligator clips, to get it working. These early tests used wires with thinner insulation for the coils, and worked until the high voltage damaged the insulation. The coils with thicker insulation, like I showed you how to make, don't have that problem. And then I started on a cleaner version. I found a pill bottle that would fit everything nicely. I hot glued the potentiometer to the back of the battery holder, as well as a transistor, but while gripping the transistor with a large metal object to absorb some of the heat. I taped the coil to the holder's cover using aluminum tape, which can handle heat, and then screwed the holder closed. Next I used hot water to remove the paper label from the bottle, and cut it in two. I made a hole in the pill bottle for the potentiometer's knob to stick out. Then, while I was at it, I also made a hole where the switch would stick out. A quick check showed that it would all fit. Next came soldering the wires in place. First up was this blue coil. One end goes to the resistor, and the other end to the base pin of the transistor, the one indicated with a B. Then I connected one end of the black coil to the collector of the transistor. Be very careful which end you connect. It has to be the end that corresponds to the end of the blue wire that goes to the resistor. The collector is the transistor's case. As you can see, I'm connecting it using a small nut and bolt through a hole in the transistor's case. And here it is done. Next, I soldered the battery negative wire, the black one, to the other pin of the transistor, the emitter pin, indicated with the letter E. Next up is to connect these two wires to this end of the switch. I started by soldering one end of a red wire to the resistor. The other wire is the remaining end of the black coil. I soldered that red wire and that black wire to one leg of the switch. I soldered the red battery positive wire to the other leg of the switch. 
Finally, it was time to connect the fluorescent light bulb tube to this coil that has many, many turns. Notice that there were two pairs of wires coming out of the tube. Treat each pair as one wire. Twist them together if you can. It doesn't matter which end of the coil is soldered to which pair. There's no polarity involved. Just solder one end of the coil to one pair of wires and the other end of the coil to the other pair of wires. And the wiring's all done. We're ready to close it up and test. After closing it up with some clear packing tape, I give it a try. It works great. It was at this point that I noticed a certain similarity to a soda can. So I cut open the top and cut a slit down the side and partway across the bottom. Next came holes for the switch and the potentiometer's knob. Time to insert it in the can and to bolt it in place. Last up was to seal it with some clear packing tape. Done! And what about in the dark? Here it is illuminating my office slash storage room. You can see it's quite bright. It's even bright enough to read by. And here it is outdoors at night, in the rain, illuminating the darkest place in our yard my worm composting bin. And after a long day building stuff, it's time to lie back and relax with a good book. Illuminated by the fruits of my labor, of course. Well, thanks for watching. See my YouTube channel, Rimstar Org, for more videos like this. That includes one explaining how the Jewel Thief circuit works, Another going step by step how to use this Jewel Thief circuit, one AA battery and a breadboard to light an LED. And for variety, why not how to make a very simple AM radio transmitter. And don't forget to subscribe if you like these videos. Or give a thumbs up or leave a question or comment below. See you in a bit.